Well, I'm making a Witcher video. Hello, and welcome back to the Bird Channel, where we talk about stories in movies, book shows, and games, and I stream on twitch.tv slash Jinzy. The YouTube algorithm is a fickle god, so if you'd like to help the channel out, please consider liking this video and leaving a comment. Apparently, even those of you who ring the bell to receive all alerts aren't seeing my videos upload, so, uh, help. You don't have to subscribe. It, it'd be cool, though. I haven't done a Witcher video in a while, especially not one that is mostly focused on just the Witcher. However, this was a request from one of my Masters of the Universe, a video that talks about the Yennefer versus Triss debate. So today, we're going to take a look at exactly what the two ladies have accomplished in both the games and the books in regards to Geralt, and to an extent Ciri as well, given that they are rather inextricably linked. We're going to use them as an example of toxic relationships in media, because they are an excellent example, but it's mostly just going to compare Yennefer and Triss. Sorry. However, if you followed me for a long enough time, then by now you know I'm Team Yennefer, for a variety of reasons, and that I don't like Triss, for a variety of reasons. So, to keep things objective, I've invited Toast. Say hello, Toast. Hello, Toast. Toast is a demonic entity from the seventh circle of hell. I choose violence every day. Yes, thank you. And they will serve as the devil's advocate to mine own thoughts. That is to say, uh, they're Team Triss. That is to say, I will be the voice of reason. Right, but kindly keep your opinions to yourself until I've explained all the facts. Without further ado, let us first compare what the ladies get up to in the books, and be warned, this video will rather heavily, and in its entirety, spoil the story for both the Witcher books and games. I also won't be explaining the story otherwise, so it helps if you know the main story beats. Hold on now, hold on. Who the fuck are you? Hello, I'm Vinegar. Vine, to friends. You're introducing too many characters in a single video. I'm here to be impartial. You both have a team? I don't. You can both shoot your shot, and I'll tell you who should be with Geralt. That sounds, uh, weirdly fair. I can live with that as long as your team Triss. Shut up and start talking. Well, uh, like I said, spoilers ahead. For those of you who came from the games, you might be surprised to hear that there is precious little of Triss in the books. She's a background character for the most part, whereas Yennefer is always positioned as Geralt's love interest. So starting with book one, The Last Wish, we just have Yennefer to contend with, and her exploits are myriad. When they initially meet, Geralt's sarcastic remark earns him a spell to the face, which he narrowly blocks, and honestly, the majority of their interactions throughout this book are pretty snide and sarcastic. While she does help Geralt heal Dandelion's throat, as asked, she also uses the bard as bait to trap Geralt in a magical rune in order to make him do her bidding. Said bidding involved Geralt going around town beating various individuals and insulting others. All of these individuals had it out for Yennefer, of course, so this was her way of paying them back. Yennefer's antics get Geralt thrown in jail, but her plan to break him out was to teleport Dandelion in to make his final wish, for everyone to believe that Geralt was innocent. She didn't know that Dandelion was not the one with the wishes, of course, so in theory, that wasn't a bad plan. In theory, yes, but Geralt had nothing to do with any of the nonsense going on in that town. He even told Yennefer he'd be willing to come back and do whatever it was she required of him. But she didn't trust him enough for that, so she uses magic. Nearly getting him killed in the process, might I add. Because if this, in theory, hadn't worked, then Geralt would have been screwed. Yes, but it did work. She fully intended to absolve him of his crimes through this method, which would have worked if Geralt had realized that he was the real wisher but no one realized that until after the fact. Uh, of course, that doesn't change the fact that she made him do all that, but still. At this point, the djinn was destroying the town, and Geralt rushed to Yennefer's side in hopes of helping her. Something Yennefer did not agree to. <clears throat> Loudly. She tried scratching his eyes out at some point, but she also created a portal to save him from the destruction of the djinn. <clears throat> Mixed signals here. As we know, to save Yennefer, Geralt made a wish to bind their destinies together as he stared at her, finding her very beautiful. And 
No, I don't think he wished for them to fall in love because, firstly, that sounds very un -Geralt, and secondly, because the rest of the books do not follow that wish at all. Yennefer hears him make that wish and is touched, so they fuck. It was very good. Apparently. So... Oh, this is taking too long! What? Taking too long. What, you're going to go through every single book and game at this pace? You've tried that already! This is the script rewrite where you added me as a way to facilitate speed. I... did? Uh, you did. Uh, your last script was about 30 pages long. The video would have been two hours. You've been trying to fit every single important bit of information into the script, but the... there's seven books and three games, and that's just listing all the things that happened. Quite frankly, even if you speed it up, this video will largely be you listing things too. I, I guess that makes sense. So, uh, how are we solving this? Lists. 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 Right, in an effort to give you all the information necessary to make up your own mind, I'm just going to give you the cliff notes on what each character gets up to during the books. I'll make a neat little graphic starting where we left off. On Yennefer's side we have Geralt runs away from Yennefer without a word after half a year of living with her in Vengerberg. She's furious, Geralt claimed she was too possessive. They meet during the dragon hunt after four years pass and Yennefer is unwilling to forgive Geralt. Yennefer calls Geralt a servile golem during the dragon trip and when Geralt saves her life during a landslide, she is still unwilling to forgive him. However, when they find the golden dragon and no one can defeat it, she offers Geralt her forgiveness in exchange for killing the dragon, which he refuses, causing her to almost cry. A very rare occurrence. She then beats up Geralt and the gang who are defending the dragon, only for her to get beaten up too and uh, threatened with a uh, group grape because she wants to take the dragon on her own and the rest of the dragon hunters don't agree. Yennefer and Geralt eventually get free and are told by the golden dragon that while they were made for each other, nothing would come of it. Yennefer insists she believes there is no limit to possibility. They hook up again for an unspecified amount of time, during which Geralt finds out that Yennefer had been bouncing between him and Isret as lovers, for a while now, and she can't decide who to stay with. It's made clear that she loves Geralt, but he won't say it out loud, and neither will she, because they're both stubborn mules. Istret promises her stability and the possibility of a child, but Yennefer doesn't love him, so she leaves them both a breakup kestrel. They meet again during Beltane, where Yennefer insists Geralt return to Sintra for Ciri, not to give up on his destined child. Are we there yet? That was book two. Two? Well, she's looking like a real winner so far. Triss gets her turn, okay? And she's going to do worse than this? Unlikely. Shut up and let me list. In Blood of Elves, Yennefer saves Dandelion from torture admits that she likes him and is thankful to him for keeping Geralt company. She writes Geralt a snarky letter after he refers to her as dear friend, but still agrees to help with Ciri as asked. She also gave Ciri room to decide whether she wanted to be taught magic by Yennefer at all, which she does. They bond like mother and daughter, Yennefer answering Ciri sincerely when she's asked questions, listening to her when she comes to her with complaints, and actually fixing them as well as giving her general life advice and fixing her nightmare problem. She also calls Ciri her ugly one and eventually reveals that she actually thinks Ciri is very pretty. On Ciri's end, she wants to stay with Geralt and Yennefer forever. Yennefer promises she will be. Love promises we can't keep. Shut up. In book four, Ciri and Yennefer leave for Gorse Velen, and after some shenanigans where Yennefer and her magical peers treat Ciri like air, Ciri runs off to find Geralt, and Yennefer follows, leading to Geralt and Yennefer making up and going to the Thanet Isle Ball together. Before that happens, Yennefer also makes sure Geralt gets paid extra on his current contract, because she doesn't want him to starve and she knows he won't accept her money directly. During the Thanet Ball, Geralt told Yennefer he loved her for the first time, and Yennefer said it back, causing Geralt to choke on his food. When the ball was over, Geralt expressed that he did not want to lose Yennefer, and actively thought up a cozy future for the two of them that included him playing the bagpipes for her. The get-together is broken up when Tissaia asks Yennefer to bring Ciri to a meeting of mages, which culminates in the war officially exploding. Ciri fleeing through the portal of Torlara and ending up in the desert, Geralt breaking his leg and teleporting off to Broccolon, and Yennefer getting shrunk into a tiny figure hanging around an elven mage's neck. You know, if Triss was around, this wouldn't have happened. Triss was around. She's the one who teleported Geralt to Broccolon. Well, you walked right into that one. 
Yeah, she did, because she's a winner. Triss being around is a good thing. It's a good thing, but we'll get to Triss later, you impatient dingbat. There's not much on Yennefer in Book 5. She's painted as a traitor, and after growing back to her regular size, she immediately plots vengeance against the people who hurt Geralt and took Ciri away. She's invited to the Lodge of Sorceresses, which she escapes almost immediately, teleporting to Skellige, determined to track down Ciri. She convinces Kraken Krayt to help her, and even convinces the goddess Freya to give her the Brisingamen so she can use it for her megascope. When she figures out where Vilgefortz is, she stages a suicide mission in an attempt to get to him and save Ciri, who she still thinks is in his grasp. She gets captured by Vilgefortz, beaten mercilessly, and dragged to a device that would allow Vilgefortz to probe her mind and find Ciri. Through extreme torture, however, Yennefer endures, gritting her teeth to the point blood trickled down her chin, desperately denying him any vision of Ciri. But she unwittingly thinks of Geralt, which gives their enemies access to his location. But didn't you skip? We will get to that! During the final book, Yennefer is rescued and Geralt and her fight Vilgefortz together. The trio is finally reunited, but only for a short time, as the Lodge summons Yennefer and Ciri to a meeting. Yennefer pleads with them to let Geralt and Ciri have a little more time together, and she herself would leave early as a hostage of goodwill. There is one more book, The Season of Storms, which takes place between Geralt running away from Vengerberg and their meeting during the Dragon Hunt. It revolves around Geralt losing his swords and desperately trying to find them again. He doesn't. Yennefer does, and she sends them back to him by the end. And that's all we get for Yennefer in the books. Now we can get to Triss. Finally, the good part. There is decidedly less of her. Which is the bad part. The books are very Yennefer-based, because Yennefer, as mentioned, is Geralt's canon one true love. Triss, however, gets a lot more attention in the games, so it balances out in the end. Having said that, she doesn't show up in the books until the third entry, Blood of Elves. Before the events there, Triss had slept with Geralt already, however. She and Yennefer were best friends, and Triss had observed Geralt and Yen's relationship with some jealousy. And so, when the two had a fight one day, Triss jumped in and used a little magic to seduce Geralt into sleeping with her. You know, like magical roofies. That's a bit leading, don't you think? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, what else would you like to call it when someone needs actual, literal magic to get a person to sleep with them? Every mage uses a little bit of magic in seducing anyone. Yennefer uses magic to make herself look prettier too. What, that doesn't count? The book doesn't say she made herself look a little prettier with magic. In fact, I, I doubt she even can. Glamourai, the stuff that makes Yennefer prettier, is something Triss would be allergic to. She can't even use magical makeup. Yes, that's specified. The direct quote is, she had seduced the Witcher with the help of a little magic. That's great, Toast. It's great. I think you're blowing it a little bit out of proportion. They were also in love, after all. They were not in love. She was literally using the opportunity to become his rebound for a night, and afterwards she fell in love with him. When Triss gets to Kaer Morhen, however, the Witcher makes it pretty clear that he doesn't want a relationship. Even so, she threw her arms around his neck and kissed him, which Geralt stopped. He did mention how happy he was to see she wasn't actually dead, though. To be fair, it isn't confirmed then and there that Geralt doesn't want to kiss her. He just pushes her away because people are coming. Maybe he wanted privacy. And that would be valid if he made any attempt otherwise to do anything with Triss, but he doesn't. Uh, no, Geralt had not asked her there to start a romance, he asked her there to figure out what's going on with Ciri. Meanwhile, Triss considers that she'd like to steal some of their secret herbs and mushrooms so she can try to use them to cure diseases like smallpox or cancer. And she didn't care if that broke the Witcher's trust. She fixes Ciri's ill-fitting clothing, stands up for her when she gets her period and the Witchers still make her train. And when it turns out that Triss is not skilled enough in magic to help Ciri, she instead teaches her elder speech, lets her put on some of her makeup and soothes her when she has nightmares. Geralt also tells her that he did not intend to cross her out of his memory, mistake or not, that she was still important to him. But Triss also spends a good amount of her time chastising the witchers in general. And with that Triss introduction, let's get back to the bullet points before I start over-detailing again.
On the road to Melitla's temple, Triss gets extremely sick, to the point where Geralt has to carry her into the bushes to do her business, and he washes and combs her every day. She's constantly trying to cuddle and kiss him, something that annoys Ciri to no end. The dwarves initially see Geralt's face as attraction to Triss, but later down the line amend that to saying, quote, Never make the same mistake, little witcher girl. If someone shows you compassion, sympathy and dedication, if they surprise you with integrity of character, value it, but don't mistake it for something else. During the Thanet Isle Rebellion in the next book, Geralt shows up and sees things he's not supposed to see. So. Triss immediately blinds him to ensure he doesn't face any consequences. She is also the one who teleports Geralt away to the safety of Broccolon after his fight with Vilgefortz. In the next book, she joins the Lodge of Sorceresses and eventually tries to find Yennefer, but can't because Yennefer is already at Vilgefortz's castle by this point. She regrets not having done more to protect Yennefer or Ciri, but she chose the Lodge, so that's that. When Ciri is brought before the Lodge afterwards and is told in no uncertain terms that she would be used as a breeding mare to fuck the Prince of Kovir so the Lodge can gain more political powers, Triss does not blink an eye. She did allow Ciri to say farewell to Geralt though, as long as she is allowed to accompany her. And that's the end of that. Case closed then. Triss is the better choice. She's been kind with a few hiccups, but at least she doesn't constantly fight with Geralt. Yes, because she's a pushover who literally won't stop salivating over the man. And also I'm not done yet, because I skipped the bits with Yennefer and Triss together. Compromising and choosing not to fight over every little thing, knowing when to back down because it isn't worth it, is not being a pushover. It's having common sense. Anyway, go on. Even after Triss's shenanigans with Geralt, Yennefer still sees her as a friend, although she warns her to stay away from her man. But more importantly, Yennefer contacts Triss before she leaves to find Vilgefortz's castle. At the start, Yennefer asks if they're alone. Triss lies and says they are, but Yennefer realizes, because Triss has the same expression on her face as she had when she started sleeping with Geralt behind Yennefer's back and Philippa Eilhart reveals herself. Yennefer then makes several requests in exchange for information to find Ciri in case she herself dies and can't save her anymore. First, she asked to ensure that the truth would be spread about her, that she was not a traitor. That was denied because it would be easier to manipulate Ciri if she didn't like her. Triss said nothing, but did then ask a boon of Yennefer to leave them a trail to Ciri. She was afraid something horrible would happen to her if she wasn't found. Yennefer agreed, but only if they would at least clear her name for Geralt. It was declined again because Philippa didn't want Geralt taking revenge. Triss said nothing again. And then Philippa mentioned that it didn't matter anyway. Geralt was probably dead, so Yennefer next asked that in exchange for information, they would save Geralt's life. Philippa declined again, stating that Geralt was nobody and Triss could only ask Yennefer to forgive her, which Yennefer did not. <clears throat> well, I mean, yes, that's bad, but we all make mistakes. <laughs> if we're not allowed to grow as a person, then what's the point in life? She didn't bat an eye at Geralt's death or Ciri's eventual fate as a breeding mare, nor did she care to even ask if they could save her former best friend. That's a mistake? Yes, that's a mistake. The Lodge held sway over her. Triss clearly thought that the Lodge's plans would be beneficial to Ciri and thought they had the best chance of finding her over Yennefer. Even if we say that's the case, which, wow, what about Geralt and Yennefer? Well, Geralt didn't want her anyway and Yennefer was out of reach. What was she supposed to do? Randomly teleport and hope she lands on one of them so she could save a singular person? Instead of using the Lodge's resources to do something productive, she's already proven that she looks at the bigger picture more than Yennefer does. Yennefer hyper-focuses on Ciri, which is great. It's her daughter, after all. But Triss takes whatever route she believes will be most successful. Not the one she hopes gets results quicker. Remember when she intended to take some witcher herbs to cure several terrible diseases? She's looking ahead. Geralt didn't want her, so it's okay if he dies? Men ain't shit. Shut up. The final bit that includes both ladies is during the pogrom of Rivia. Initially, Triss wants to run away and Yennefer stays to fight, followed by Yennefer wanting to run away and Triss staying to fight, and them together creating a whole new spell because of a split lip. Yennefer, then finding Geralt's body, exhausts herself to death in an attempt to bring him back to life. And Triss looks on, thinking to herself that it would do no good. 
Then Siri arrives to save the day, of course, and that's the story of the books. That was still really long. Can we just skip the games and talk about who wins and why now? No, we're doing the games too. Do it faster. Oh, you're still here. Make it faster. Fine, I'll give you the super cliff notes. As said, the games start with Triss. When Seda Project made The Witcher 1, apparently they were unsure if they could do Yennefer and Ciri justice, so they substituted Yennefer with Triss and Ciri with Alvin. By that logic, Triss gained a few Yennefer traits, mainly that she absolutely stands up to Geralt quite a bit. In short, Triss still works with the Lodge in this game and refuses to tell Geralt much of his past life. He has amnesia now, so she can basically tell him whatever he wants. During one scene, she even mentions that she has him wrapped around her finger, and she and the Lodge use him often for errands and influencing things the way they want. Which is also why she gets furious with you if you don't give her Elvin, and she remains mad the entirety of the game. Eventually, she'll even get mad when Geralt calls her Triss, because people might think they're more than friends. I guess she was so mad she forgot that was just her actual name? I'm guessing that's a Yennefer leftover, whom Geralt likes to call Yen. She also states that if we'd given Elvin to her, none of the bad things would have happened. Something we can immediately disprove by playing Triss's path, because the bad things still happen? But yes, she blames Geralt for everything at this point. She does save Geralt through teleportation a few times throughout the game, though, and if you choose her path, she assaults the Salamandra base with you. And it is most likely the canon path, as it ensures that the Lodge's power grows, and Triss is reinstated as Foltest's advisor. During The Witcher 2, Yennefer still isn't around, and all we hear about her is that Geralt exchanged himself for her with the Wild Hunt to save her life. Triss, meanwhile, has returned to be more like her book self in nature, although they also give her bright red hair. She is the canon romance, regardless of what you did in The Witcher 1, and when Geralt is accused of killing Foltest, she's thrown out as well. When Geralt breaks out of prison, he asks Triss to, and I quote, and I need you to tell me about Yennefer, in detail. I want to hear it all. Even the things you don't want to tell me. Even the things that might hurt. Except she definitely doesn't, because the Lodge is never mentioned, and somehow they're still in a relationship too. Even so, she tells Geralt that if he wanted to drop everything to find Yennefer, she would help him, even if it meant traveling to the end of the world. By now, Triss's connection to the Lodge is weakening because she's in a relationship with Geralt. They stop trusting her completely, but still feed Geralt information through her, and Triss does still work for them as far as she knows, until she finds out that she's been cold-shouldered midway through the first arc. At that point, she's kidnapped, and we don't see her again, until she is decompressed in Loch Muin and tortured by Nilfgaard for information on the Lodge. This is where Geralt finds her if you choose her path. And he is very annoyed indeed, because by this point, he has his memory back and realized that she didn't tell him everything. She also says, and I quote, I never lied to you, I just didn't tell you everything. To which Geralt responds, how is that not lying? It's not lying, because she wasn't even sure about a lot of this information until now. She wasn't sure the Lodge existed outside of that. Just let me finish and then we can talk. We still have The Witcher 3 to go. I'm going to have to really cut that one down. Neither Yennefer nor Triss give you much trouble if you break up with them. Yennefer had been looking for Ciri well before Geralt had with help of Nilfgaard, and she is unrelenting in her cause, as ever. Stealing a mask from Ermion, prodding the memories of mourning women, and using necromancy in a beautiful garden, totally ruining it. She does go out of her way to take the blame for it, so Geralt is absolved from all consequences, she will do anything to save her daughter, no matter who gets hurt along the way. Triss, on the other hand, is met in Novigrad, now trying to collect funds to save the mages stuck in the city. Her and Geralt have broken up after the truth came out at the end of The Witcher 2. She even admits to having taken advantage of him in an offhand comment on the road. In an effort to find Ciri, she willingly lets herself get tortured by witch hunters in order to gain information. But at a garden party, she pretends to be drunk in order to try and kiss Geralt. She was drinking wine! She was drunk! Or at least tipsy! Weird how she sobered up immediately the second someone else came into view. They were a sobering view. Shut up! She eventually becomes a proper leader of the Novigrad mages and leads them to freedom at risk of her own life. 
When Yennefer makes it to Kaer Morhen, she does not inform anyone that she wants to try the Trial of the Grasses, or at least part of it, on Uma, because she doesn't think the Witchers would understand or agree. Which they don't. They only reluctantly allow it anyway. In general, though, she orders them around a lot. The series' arrival at Kaer Morhen is also the only time you ever hear Yennefer loudly squeal anyone's name. There's also a point in time where Ciri asks Geralt to go fight Imlarith with her in secret, which we do. And when you tell Triss, she gets upset with you, not understanding how Geralt could allow it. Yennefer instead already assumed it was Ciri's idea and was glad Geralt came along. When Geralt notes he thought she might be angry, she responds with, Why? Because you supported Ciri in her decision, or because you fought by her side and won? In general, Triss seems to have less confidence in Geralt altogether. She doesn't see how Geralt could get on board of Emir's ship, for example, whereas Yennefer just states, don't panic, he'll find a way. A few other notes are of importance. When we find Sheila de Tansarville in a cell, even though Yennefer clearly hated the Lodge, she still shows empathy for her and outrage at how she was treated. She's also unwilling to admit to Ciri that she did meddle in the gene mutations of Lara Doran's blood straight up lying to her face about it. But she also defends Ciri against the elf in Avalach's lab and draws a funny little moustache on Avalach's portrait. Triss, meanwhile, is willing to turn down a comfortable house in Kovir in a position of power, heading the new council and conclave of mages for Geralt. Yennefer's ending is a quiet home away from politics and monarchs, with late breakfasts in bed and lazy strolls with conversation. Trissa's ending has a house in Kovir and a home smelling of cakes, where guests were always welcome. I like cake. Didn't ask. Now you know everything important that happened in the books and the games. At least all the things I found important. Yennefer is positioned as the woman who built walls around her heart. She trusts with extreme difficulty, putting up her guard immediately. It means the people around her often chastise her on her initial attitude, strengthening that belief. Geralt often mentions that arguing with Yennefer is pointless, and contradicting her inevitably leads to a fight. Which wasn't always the safest thing to do. It is alluded that Yennefer and Geralt had heated fights while they lived together, where things were thrown and Geralt was cold and sarcastic. At the same time, she shows concern and kindness several times. She once saved a dwarven family from a pogrom and helped a pregnant woman on the docks of Skellige. Even though it ripped her very expensive dress, she clearly cares about the troubles of others, even if she often pretends not to, especially non-humans. She believes women do not need a man to care for them. She's rare to praise, but when she does so, she does so sincerely, and she is absolutely willing to die for the people she loves. Triss, on the other hand, is warm-hearted and kind from the outset. She never comes across as uncaring, and indeed she cares a lot. She's younger than Yennefer, and so perhaps less jaded. Uh, her main drive seems to be finding a place where she belongs, and is willing to sacrifice a great deal just to feel accepted in that way. It's why she initially lets everyone, including the Lodge and Geralt, walk all over her. She relents to Geralt constantly, changing her tune immediately when she notices he's put off by anything she does. She doesn't want to argue. When she does something awful, like torture, she immediately feels bad after doing so, even if it was for a good cause. During The Witcher 3, she finally finds her own path and stands on her own two legs, proving that she needs nothing and no one but her own brains and brawn. I think one of the main important differences is also that Yennefer, generally speaking, openly does shady things. Triss does so behind your back, for the most part. But they both do shady things. Also, Triss literally says she doesn't like a guy, because he's too fat. Yennefer throws out a perfectly good bed because she's mad Geralt has a life outside of her. Oh, shut up. None of that matters. Talk about Geralt. What about Geralt? Yeah, what about Geralt? Well, he's the object of everyone's affection, right? So how does he feel about each lady? Well, Yennefer is Geralt's one true love. The books are true canon, so whatever we see in the games is pure fiction. So why are we still discussing the games anyway? Because it's Yennefer versus Triss. Triss is barely in the books. In the books, it's pretty clear Geralt wants to be with Yennefer. Not much of a debate there, then, is there, Dingbat? We don't get too much on Geralt's thoughts about Triss because, as said, she isn't around much in the books. And in the games, it's up to you. You don't get Geralt's thoughts, just whatever he says out loud. In the book, Geralt's future wishes involve Triss just as a friend. On the road, he makes it clear that she's a good friend. Ciri also sees Yennefer as her mother, whereas Triss sees Ciri as her little sister. 
there's a clear dynamic set up. In the games, depending on who you date, Geralt says that with Yennefer, it was fight after fight, whereas with Triss, it was more peaceful. In a lot of ways, Yennefer positions herself more as Geralt's equal, Triss much less so. When it comes to the people playing the game, it's also more up to what they want. Rather than thinking about what canon lore book Geralt would want, it's your story, not Geralt's. Okay, yes, but um, okay, but what about Geralt? Like, what about him? Eh, uh, you lost me. Yeah, I just talked about him. Oh, right, we're just going to ignore that. Okay, well, talk about how Geralt is a piece of shit, actually. Oh, oh, yeah, Geralt's not Mr. Perfect, is he? Everyone always focuses on just the two women in his life, the good points, the bad points, but Geralt does some really shady stuff himself. From endlessly scrutinizing the people he meets, including the women, to running away from Yennefer in the middle of the night and then coming back to her four years later, simply assuming that Yennefer would be okay with shagging on top of some sheepskins in a wagon without a second thought. Which is extra ironic because he holds a grudge like no other, throwing the servile golem insult in Yennefer's face at every opportunity, lying about having slept with another woman while Yennefer was getting tortured in Vilgefortz's castle, or that time he lost his swords and Yennefer went and found them for him? How did he repay that kindness? He slept with the messenger she sent along with the swords. Also, fun fact, before sleeping with Triss, Geralt described her as chestnut-haired. Chestnut, not fiery bright red, sometimes also referred to as auburn. Triss Marigold, cheerful, giggling for no reason, looking like a teenager. Looking like a teenager. He also slept with Shani, who was 17 years old at the time. And here's a fun one. In Season of Storms, Geralt gets a girl, Mosaic, in trouble for flirting with her in front of her mage mistress, Coral. Coral, who physically abuses Mosaic constantly. Geralt is aware of this. By the end of the book, he runs off with Mosaic to sleep with her for a little bit, only to then send her back to this abusive mage, where she, unsurprisingly, gets abused for doing so. And his solution to problems in life are generally to retreat within himself, push everyone away and become melancholy as fuck. I don't like Geralt. I like Triss. You know what? I don't particularly like any of them. <gasps> Wait, but you're Team Yennefer. How are you Team Yennefer then? I'm Team Yennefer because one, it's the actual canon romance. Geralt loves Yennefer canonically. Two, she's an interesting character. I like reading about her, seeing what she'll do next. But when it comes down to it, none of these characters are good and stable people who should ever be used as an example of a healthy relationship. A lot of relationships in media these days are not exactly models of grace. You know the tropes. The person who stalks everything related to their love interest. The person who watches you sleep. Who is possessive as hell. Who physically fights their love, but it's okay, we can fix them. Enemies to lovers is often used not as a moment of growth, but to just get two enemies to hate fuck. Almost every single relationship in popular media comes with some form of added trauma. And I don't mean the couple goes to therapy together, I mean that they're toxic. When it comes to people arguing about whether Yennefer or Triss is the best choice, generally speaking, it's not a case of I love this person because of all these good things they do and stand for. It's a case of, well, at least she's not that other person. That's not an argument, that's coping. I don't like Yennefer because she treats Geralt like a dog. They fight constantly and she literally doesn't care what happens as long as she gets her way. Not to mention her sleeping with Istreth at the same time as sleeping with Geralt. Mage society or not, that's garbage. Triss is hot and has always come across to me as sweet and kind-hearted. Not to mention, she progresses as a character to the point where she is her own person, and that person is willing to sacrifice her life for that of others. I don't like Triss because I can't get over the grape situation, her willingness to let Geralt die, and equal willingness to send Ciri off to become a Koviri breeding horse for the Lodge, nor her constant lying to Geralt during the games. Yennefer doesn't dance around issues and has not only shown a willingness to die for her loved ones, but has actually, physically, risked her life for them. She's only cold to begin with. Hell, she exchanges wolf puns with Geralt during The Witcher 3. You just need to get to know her first. I like neither of them because both of them have put Geralt in an abusive relationship and, dare I say, Geralt is as bad as the both of them. Are you saying we simply shouldn't choose either? That's exactly what I'm saying. None of these people should be in a relationship. They're not ready for it, if they ever will be. 
sex sells, but so does romance. The will-they-won't-they they dynamic is very popular currently, as it ever has been. That means most shows and books will include some form of it, but they want you to get invested in those characters, so they will rarely swap them out, even when it obviously doesn't work. Character X and character Y have been through so much together, they have to end up together, right? And writing in a whole new love interest that doesn't jive with the show or its audience is an expensive risk to take. However, without stakes and drama, it's also hard to keep anyone interested, so they add drama. A lot of it. Someone lied to their love interest. Maybe they had a big blowout fight. There might have even been a physical fight. But then, the writers find a way to bring them back together. They exchange I'm sorry's. They promise to do better, to not let it happen again. Look how strong their bond is. But then the plot requires drama once more, and there they go again. If you've ever been in a relationship like this, then you know how damaging this sort of behavior is. Getting a sorry, but no change. Making a promise you don't follow through on. Neglect. Constant fighting. Gaslighting. Shows make it look cute because they write the characters. They can make them say and accept whatever they want. But that's not how relationships work. When I see people write fanfiction about a Bakugo and Deku relationship in My Hero Academia, I die a little inside every time. For those unfamiliar, Bakugo is a guy who absolutely will not stop verbally abusing those around him, including Deku. Deku is still desperate to have some form of friendship with him. It looks really cute in the show, is really unhealthy to emulate. Killing Stalking, Harley Quinn and the Joker, Twilight, Grease. Every single movie where a person is kidnapped and they develop a romantic relationship with their kidnapper while silly hijinks ensues. How romantic. Let's not even start about the relationship where one of them thinks they can fix the other. It's probably important to consider that fictional characters are never written to be role models. They're written to be interesting. You can find them relatable in some ways, but aspiring to be like them is never going to work out because your life isn't a script. Making Geralt choose between Yennefer and Triss and making Yennefer and Triss patiently wait who he will choose is asinine. And none of them are right for each other. Honestly, Margarita Loantil had the right idea. Don't get tied down as a mage and also don't get tied down as a witcher. Both of you start with an absolutely brutal childhood where you see kids die around you and where you're worked to the bone after being literally thrown away by your parents. Of course, that's not going to breed healthy individuals. Are you serious? So where does that leave us? Who wins here? Well, no one. They all need therapy. For the love of God, go to therapy. Seriously, try therapy. The ideal relationship in The Witcher is a man and his horse. No, not like that, stop it. When asked about his characters, Sapkowski has often said that he writes characters to progress the story. He doesn't want to write things that go nowhere, which is probably why Season of Storms was his worst entry. It couldn't go anywhere. The Witcher, without any of the three characters we've discussed, is not The Witcher. They all have a role to play. Getting weirdly invested in any fictional character isn't healthy. I have to check myself on that one sometimes too. But when it comes to Yennefer and Triss specifically, it always goes way too far. And that brings me to one other thing I need to talk about too. And that's people linking their entire personality, and with that, other people's personality, to their fictional characters. Now, oh, let someone assuming you support war crimes because you happen to find a character who happens to be a war criminal interesting. Exactly. Just because you like Triss doesn't mean you condone everything she does. Just because you like Yennefer doesn't mean you're a cold-hearted bitch. Exactly. Pretty easy these days to connect your entire personality to fictional work, though, given how much of life takes place online. Especially with the, um, the panini, where everyone's inside and we've all consumed a lot more media altogether. If you weren't constantly in the know on the latest updates, you couldn't always join in on the conversation. And even without the panini, I'm sure I don't need to tell you about fandoms. Succumbing to complete fandom craze is easy enough to do. For some people it's an escape, for some people it's a place to belong, and for yet others it's the only personality trait they've adopted. Whenever someone then attacks whatever you've invested so much of your time in, well, you get defensive. For those around for a long enough time, you know I've been on the receiving end of the wrath of a certain fandom myself. This included every nasty message imaginable, up to and including threats of the lethal kind, because I didn't enjoy a particular piece of media. And when we're talking about any specific character, especially something known as a comfort character, things can get really hairy. The reverse is also true. Cosplayers who cosplay characters that aren't very well loved, or are in fact hated, get a lot of flack simply for existing. 
Remember Joffrey from Game of Thrones? His actor received heat for playing the character at all. Just because a character has flaws doesn't mean you're not allowed to like them. You don't need anyone's permission to enjoy or not enjoy stuff. Yennefer and Triss have both done bad things, but that doesn't erase the good things they've done, nor would it matter if it did. Fictional characters are there for our enjoyment. Constantly feeling like you need to justify liking or not liking one or the other is exhausting. And trust me, the fictional characters don't know that you're valiantly defending or attacking them. They're not real. That doesn't mean don't have an opinion, but maybe don't shove it into every conceivable conversation. If someone's enjoying a thing, don't insert yourself to make sure they know you don't. If someone doesn't enjoy a thing, that's not a call for you to list why they're wrong. I'm a demon, but even I draw a line somewhere. Giving people shit over cosplay or acting roles is pretty gnarly. Toast, we don't say gnarly anymore. The last time I was here was in the 70s, and it was totally tubular then, so you can shove off. Anyway, today's conclusion is that nobody wins. You should just like whatever feels good to you. Stop pitting fictional characters against each other like they actually give a damn, because they don't exist. They do not need your protection. Let people like who they like. Let me have my running gag about not liking Triss, and let 90% of my TikTok comments be about how much they hate Yennefer. I could not care less, and neither could Yennefer. Geralt should ride off into the sunset with his horse, and occasionally host dinner parties at Corvo Bianco, while co-parenting Ciri with Yennefer, and occasionally having Triss bake some of those pies the ending slides talk about. For the dinner party, of course. They can be friends with benefits. All of them. Geralt and Triss. Geralt and Yennefer. Yennefer and Triss. Geralt, Yennefer, and Triss. As long as we leave Siri out of it. Oh, God, yes, no, that's Why absolutely you awful. Watching? And until I'm another tale finds you. I have a life outside of this. My soul, my heart, I'm a demon.